Dobro večer, poštovani gosti, ako niste, evo molim vas da, da zauzmete svoja mjesta. A, htio bih vam poželjeti kao prvo dobrodošlicu i našu zahvalnost u ime domaćine udruge Fokus u našem prostoru. Ako niste bili, dakle, ovo je sjedište udruge Fokus u Hrvatskoj. I dopustite mi sam par trenutaka da vam predstavim našu udrugu. Dakle, mi kao udruga postojimo u Hrvatskoj već 25 godina. A, kao udruga Fokus se bavimo sa različitim segmentima društva. Naš osnovni moto i nekakvi razlog postojanja je u, mod, u, svome, u svoje srži ove rečenici mijenje sebe, mijenje društvo. Mi kao udruga vjerujemo da, da samo inicijativni, proaktivni pojedinci koji odlučuju raditi na sebi, koji odlučuju ne kriviti vladu, druge bolesti, druge države i sve nekakve žive i nežive okolnosti, nego da pojedinci koji preuzimaju odgovornost za svoj život i za svoju osnovnu nadogradnju, svjesno ili nesvjesno zapravo postaju nekakvi agenti promjene u društvu. Vjerujemo da, i vjerujem da i vi to vjerujete da u našem društvu su potrebne promjene i kroz na radnom mjestu, u školama, u u svim nekim etapama života. Inače, kao druga fokus smo raščlanjeni u nekoliko odjela, dakle, bavimo se sa radom sa mladima, studentima, srednjoškolcima, bavimo se sa obiteljima kroz naš vid djelovanja koji se zove fokus obiteljski život, radimo sa zaposlenima, danas ste vi u jednom tom kontekstu i ovdje s nama, dakle, svijet zaposlenih i uglavnom kroz sve te nekakve naše segmente vidova djelovanja na određene grupacije korisnika želimo utjecati sa različitim radionicama, programima, gostovanjima, koje kakvih renomiranih gostiju gdje progovaramo o ovim temama. Ako vas više zanima o našoj udruzi, slobodno otičite na našu web stranicu koja je www.ufokus, dakle jedna riječ ufokus.hr ili je kom? HR. HR. I isto tako ovoga, lajkajte našu Facebook stranicu da se ovo viralno, viralno širi. Da ja ne dužim sa udrugom Fokus, dakle ja sam jedan od djelatnika kao i moj kolega Nolan. Slobodno nas pitajte više o našoj udruzi, potražite način kako se možete uključiti kroz razne volonterske programe koje, koje radimo. Ali da ja ne duži, pozvat ću kolegu Nolana koji će predstaviti današnje naše cijenjene govornike i udrugu Partner koja je partner u, ovoj, u ovom događaju. Hvala. Hvala, ja ću par reći na hrvatskom da čujete kako to zvuči kad stranac govori vaše. A, a, da, mi smo isto ovaj, organizirali u korpice sa partnerom. A, ja bih vas zamolio, možete da pedignite ruka, jeste li ikad bili na Equip ili na Global Leadership Summit ili da, da znate koji a, Dražen, a, dr. Dražen Glavaš bio, možete da, da vidimo ruke. Onda dijelimo što, to, to super, onda vidimo da imamo ovu našu ekipu, ali isto proširimo ekipu, ovo je ovaj, baš, baš lijepo. Um, maybe I'll switch to English. So I, I, um, we've had a great time uh, this week with our guests. Uh, Todd and Ron bring a lot of experience. I just wanted to say a little about uh, what they've been doing. And maybe, so I'm, I, uh, I'm not a Croat, but I, I like to say I'm Hrvatski Zet. This is my wife, Sandra, <laughs> in the back. She, OK. Um, so uh, yeah, so where we've been this week, uh, anybody been uh, heard of something called PSAC? in CSAC, Post-Lignin Incubator CSAC. It's a wonderful story. We were there on Tuesday. My wife, Sandra, and her boy both uh, finished the gymnasium in CSAC. It is a very, it's a, one of the places in Croatia where you know things are very hard. And yet in the middle of CSAC, there is a Croatian, uh, uh, in, there are several institutions, Applied Ceramics, which employs about 150 people, uh, making machinery for all over the world. Um, in the semiconductor industry, there is a culinary institute and 100% of their graduates are employed, without a question. So if you know a young Croatian person who's not sure what they want to do with their life and they can get a loan for about 4,000 euros, in about three months they can finish cooling in CSAC and be employed like that. So it was wonderful to be with them. Uh, on, on Tuesday, yesterday we were at Floy in, in Varaždin, which was a really, also a really great experience to see uh, uh, what they are doing uh, in that university department. And we were, Todd and Ron were in two different classes there. And we just raced here from Vern, where we also, uh, Todd and Ron presented in a class there. So it has been a really um, great experience to have them with us. This is our event on our, my home turf here in Udruga Focus. So I wanted to say something. I didn't tell these guys this. So, because I've been listening to them, and with my sort of half-quarter creation brain, listening to them all this time. One of my friends is here tonight, Fran. Fran, uh, Fran and I had sons in, in first uh, through eighth grade together at Oslo Moskola Prečko, right here in the neighborhood. 
Uh, and when we met, I remember Franz said, wait, what, you're an American, what are you doing here? And then we talked, and what's your dad do, what's my dad do? He said his father is a professor, teaches nuclear engineering here in Zagreb. And I said, oh, my dad actually also worked in the nuclear en engineering industry and came to Kursko a couple of times back in the day. And Franz, I think, was very skeptical about this, because you said you went and asked your father if he'd heard of my dad, and your dad didn't remember my dad, and so that seemed <laughs> like you weren't sure what to make of that, right? So my father spent his entire working career in Westinghouse Electric Corporation, responsible for making many of the nuclear power plants in the world. Um, none of theirs have ever blown up, which you're very <laughs> proud of. Um, but all that to say that I watched my dad, and uh, someone who in the, in large, how would I say this, in large corporations in the United States, people often do their work very, very well for a very, very long time, and don't think much of it, or don't talk about it that much, or don't, they don't come across Bahat, Oho, you know, many of these terms. So as I've been listening to Ron and Todd this whole time, they have underplayed themselves at various moments. So coming from a Croatian perspective, you gotta listen carefully to what they're saying and the few points they will reference, um, the, the numbers of people that they led and managed in their careers. And so this is very much boiled down from an enormous amount of experience and leadership in both of their cases. Working in Procter & Gamble is one of the world's leading organizations for developing um, managers. I, I think at one point there was like of the American F Fortune 500 companies, like a hundred or more would be former CEO. I mean, the, uh, of the CEOs, massive numbers have been people who had come up through Procter & Gamble at one time or another. Um, and, and Ron has incredible stories about one of the great, his own great stories about one of the greatest stories in the world right now, one of the most interesting stories in the world right now is the development, the rise of China and having uh, managed company, uh, managing Ford's expansion into China factories wise. Right? So I didn't even tell them I was going to say that. But I, I just I felt that envy <coughs> listening to them all this time and kind of hearing people and not realizing um, you, you have a great opportunity this evening to learn uh, from people who, who really have a really rich experience. So after I pop that on you without saying any warning, <laughs> may I introduce <laughs> Todd Geist too as our first. Great. Thank you. Good evening everyone. It is a Pleasure for me, I think I can say for us, to, uh, to be here this evening. And uh, I just wanted to share with you that I, I think our actions speak louder than our words, right? We all agree to that? And this is my fourth trip to Zagreb. And I think my actions speak louder than my words, that I really like Croatia a lot. I, I keep coming back, and I, ha I have evidence to show you uh, having been here several times now. And one, uh, one other interesting personal comment is that last September, my wife and I and another couple who are friends, we came and spent maybe 10 days visiting across Croatia, going to your national parks and, yes, to the coastline and enjoyed, uh, enjoyed some time throughout your country. So it's a, it is a special place for us. We also love football, your football, not our football. <laughs> and uh, Ivan Rakitic is one of, our, uh, one of our favorite players on Barcelona. So our topic for this evening is leadership for success. And so I'm thinking that everybody here probably came thinking they were coming for some leadership training. Is this true? Are you here for some leadership training? Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Maybe we, should, maybe we should close the door. Yeah. <laughs> Don't leave yet, okay? But what I want you to know right from the start this evening is that you're not here for leadership training. You are here for success training. And I'm not going to talk about get rich quick kind of success, but we are going to start our discussion today talking about the destination that we seek with our leadership. Yes, we'll talk a lot about leadership but never lose sight of the fact that this leadership is simply a vehicle, if I can use that word, Ron, a, a vehicle to find our way to achieving that which matters most to us, which is success. So I'll say more, I'll define those terms further in just a moment. So our objective this evening with you is to do a couple of things. We wanna help grow your knowledge of leadership but as I look around the room, I see a lot of people who probably already have a lot of knowledge about leadership. 
So one thing I would say is if all we did was fill your brains with more knowledge this evening, I don't think we would have achieved success together. Real success looks like having everybody leave here at the end of this evening with some very specific changes in behavior that you can start to implement tomorrow. We'll give you the rest of the night off, okay, after you go home. But, uh, but I, I hope you can start to do some things differently, no kidding, tomorrow. Now those are two objectives. I'd like to add a third if it's okay with you. May I add a third? Yeah, okay. All right, well here you go. Let's have some fun together, okay? None of us have to be here this evening. And uh, all of us, uh, I would really like for all of us to want to be here throughout the evening. And so let's not only learn together, but let's also spend some time having some fun. We really look forward to getting to know you all throughout this evening. So now I'll give you a chance to get to know me a little bit better. So Todd Geist is my name. I am from Cincinnati, Ohio in the U.S. How many of you have been to the United States? Raise your hands high. Okay, We're good. How many of you have been to the state of Ohio? Yeah, good. How many of you have been to the city of Cincinnati? Really? How many of you have been to my home in Cincinnati, Ohio? Ron. Yeah. <laughs> I had a feeling Ron was going to be the only one who, uh, who could answer that one. All right, great. So uh, I am married to Shauna. You see uh, my wife and, and my kids here. Uh, my kids are university age, and uh, so I uh, spend a lot of time with, uh, with people in, the, in that university age point of life at this point. I worked my career at Procter & Gamble more than 30 years and retired about two years ago, and at that point founded a nonprofit organization, which you'll hear us mention a couple times tonight, which is called Global Leadership Partners, which our, our focus is on doing leadership right, meaning uh, doing it in a way that really is emphasizing integrity and principles and values and things of that nature based on my, our experience over the years. So one thing I'd like to share is that I did live in Bulgaria, your, your neighbor uh, a couple of countries to the east. I lived there for one year. I was not on the Procter & Gamble payroll at that point. I took a one-year leave of absence and worked as a volunteer teacher in Bulgaria. Uh, I have since visited this uh, Central and Eastern European region about 30 times, so I'm, I'm no stranger to, uh, to this overall region. Last thing I wanted to mention is I love, uh, I am a Christian, that, that my Christian faith is a very important part of my daily life, and I love to travel, wouldn't surprise you. I, uh, I love to hike. We've already had some, some brief conversations about hiking, and uh, I have had an opportunity to do some hiking here. And uh, I love sports, I love, uh, I love uh, basketball, I love American football, and I, I do love this sport that you probably all know as real football, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so that's a quick introduction to me. Let me turn it over to Ron. Good evening. <clears throat> I'm also from Cincinnati, Ohio. So this is part of how we probably got connected growing up or being close to each other and, and where we live. Uh, I'm married to Karen. She's a beautiful lady right here. We've been married 32 years, mm -hmm. and we have three daughters. They're in the picture, and uh, two of them are married, and their husbands are in the picture. One of them's about to be married in May. This one is going to marry that one in May. So by May, <laughs> all my children will be married and gone, except the surprise one. This little guy, uh, we met in China when we were on assignment there, and we adopted him. So I'm, although I'm retired from the Ford Motor Company, I have a six and a half year old son, which is adding a lot of uh, inspiration and it's keeping, I think it will keep me young. <laughs> um, so I mentioned I worked for Ford for 30 plus years and just a, a brief uh, summary of that. I started as an engineer, base engineer, worked in the company, worked there and worked for uh, many different parts in different states. and. And then, and then finally, I worked in the position of executive director of, of manufacturing a powertrain for the country of China. That sounds really big, but China's a big country. Um, and, and, and I was very proud of the fact that I got to live in China for five years, uh, get to know Chinese people, Chinese culture, uh, and, and do a lot of great work there and, and really uh, enhanced my life. And uh, 
in terms of personal interest, investing in people. This is very important to me. I love to teach. I love to invest in people and share what I do know. Uh, I've always been a big believer if you can teach people and show people and, and help them be successful, help them become better leaders, that teaching will not go to waste and will go on for a long time. That, I got to agree. That mean hurry up? <laughs> <laughs> I think it means I accidentally pressed them. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Uh, other things, I like the woodwork. Anybody woodwork? All right. Yeah, we can talk later. <laughs> we will. Okay. All right. So that I, I like to, to, to make things out of wood because it's just, uh, it's actually pretty forgiving. You can mold it and change it to make it fit. It's very beautiful in the end. Uh, in terms of sports, snowboarding, water skiing, I've asked this question everywhere and nobody snowboards or water skis. No? Just to you, it's, it's an American thing. <laughs> disc golf. Anybody ever disc golf? Okay, it's like playing frisbee on a golf course. And you throw into a basket. It's kind of it's kind of kind of coming up in the United States. It's a lot of fun. And the best thing about it is it's always free. You have to pay to do it. So that's probably why. Maybe one reason I do it more than anything else in terms of sports. But that's me, and uh, I'm, I'm going to have a chance to talk to you in a little bit. My throat's a little hoarse, so it's gonna, I'm going to have to really be careful and maybe minimize my words so I can be able to present effectively. Thank you. Okay, one more introduction to make, and that is of the company that I will be referring to this evening, and that is Procter & Gamble. This is our world headquarters where I spent many years of my career in Cincinnati, Ohio. You see some really big numbers on the left-hand side, but if you know anything about Procter & Gamble, you know our story is not told by numbers, our story is told by brands. Brands that I hope are in your homes. <laughs> and uh, what are some of those brands? Do you know any, uh, any Procter & Gamble brands? Head & Shoulders. Head & Shoulders, Pampers, very good. What else? Any others? Can't think of any others? All right, I'll show you the answers. So here are some of our brands, some of our bigger brands. You know, Tide and Ariel, Gillette, yeah, Braun, Oral B, Blendamed is one. It's not up there. They sell Blendamed here, toothpaste. Yeah. All right. So hopefully you recognize many of these brands. But the last thing I wanted to tell you about P and G is something that uh, Nolan mentioned, and that is many years when independent studies are done of the top companies in the world in developing leaders, Procter & Gamble is number one. Most every year it's in the top two or three somewhere. So I, I, have, I had a, a real privilege. It was a, a blessing for me to work at this company and to learn leadership uh, from one of the best institutions in the world. And what we're going to share with you this evening will be many of the same principles and some experience from my time at Procter & Gamble. So I want to start with some very basic things just to establish a, a, a base, a common base of understanding. One thing I want to talk about is what the dictionary has to say about leadership. It says leadership is going before or with others to show the way. All right. So there's an important word there called others. I once heard somebody said that if you think you're leading others, and you look over your shoulder and no one is following, you're really just going for a walk, okay? You're really, you're really not leading. But there's no surprises here. You guys know this. The reason that I show this is I, I like to, right at the beginning, make the emphasis about what this doesn't say. I think it's more important what the dictionary doesn't say than what it does say. So nowhere up here does it say that the leader is the person who is in the, the top box in the organization chart. It doesn't say it's the person who has the really fancy title, like president or chief executive. And it's not, it's not necessarily that person who's on your, your national currency. It doesn't have to be just those people. In fact, the real answer to the question, who can be a leader, you can find out if you, if you look into this mirror and use your imagination a little bit, because the fact is, all of us can be leaders, and all of us can grow as leaders, and you guys know that, and that's why you're here this evening. So now I want to talk about our second 
The second word in our title, remember leadership for success. So now we wanna talk about success a little bit. This one I think is especially important because it's often misunderstood. So you see here, it says an accomplishment of a goal or a purpose. And so let me build on that a bit and talk about what success is not. When we talk about having an accomplishment of a goal or a purpose, that can be something that is very individualized, right? Each of us could have and may, may well have our own unique goal or purpose. So nowhere up here in the dictionary does it say that success is the one who dies with the biggest pile of money. It doesn't say that success is the one who's famous around the world or has great power over people. In fact, once again, success can be something that is very personal. So we're going to spend some time this evening in this very first session really emphasizing what is our definition of success. So why do we need leadership? Here's a great quote from A.G. Lafley. He's a former chief executive of P&G. He said, the scarcest resource in the world today is leadership. Leadership capable of transforming organizations to win in tomorrow's fast changing and increasingly competitive world. So <clears throat> let's uh, just to get things warmed up here a little bit this evening. Let me, let me ask a question first of all. You guys understanding me okay? Pace is good, volume is good. Content is good? <laughs> haven't, haven't given you much yet, right? You're not sure on that one. <laughs> all right. Well, I'd, I'd like just to hear your thoughts. I know all of you have had some leaders that have been effective. What are some characteristics that made them effective? What are they? Choosing the right communication channels and communication uh, ways of... Okay. Yeah. yeah. Good communicators and good use of communication media approaches, yeah. Others? Doing less, making more. Okay, <laughs> good. I like that. What else? Faith in what they're doing. All right, good. Yeah, they believe what they're doing matters. Yeah. Oftentimes it relates to their definition of success, right? To their purpose. What else? Empathy. Empathy. Excellent. Excellent. Emotional intelligence kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, knowing uh, how to align the needs and wants and uh, purposes of individuals and other parts of their team into the collective roles. Good, good. So there's a certain and a very important working effectively with others components of that, right? Aligning others to a vision. All right, good. Some excellent inputs, and now I want to take a turn. I don't know about you, but when I have a leader who is not effective, this is exactly how I feel. Can you guys relate to this? Yeah. So when you have a leader who is not effective, what are some characteristics? How would you describe that person? What comes to mind? They're confusing. They're not so good at communicating, right? Or maybe they're confused <laughs> and not so good at thinking. What else? Aggressive. Hmm? Aggressive. Aggressive. Yeah. Yeah. Unorganized. Unorganized. Yeah. Why are they aggressive oftentimes? Because they don't know how to organize themselves on the team. Or yeah. They don't know how to transport, uh, transfer the message. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So maybe it's lack of communication skills. Yeah. Good. What else? Rigid. Hmm? Rigid. Rigid, yeah. My way or the highway, right? <laughs> what else? Anything else come to mind? I know we all have experience with leaders who are not effective, so. They don't have any certain goals. Uh -huh. They're very unhappy. Yeah. So they want to make others. <laughs> <laughs> Misery loves company, so they want to. Bring some others along on their journey of misery. Yeah, good. Well, thank you guys for what you've shared. One thing that I, I would like to, uh, I'd like to ask you is, what is most often the root issue for ineffective leaders? 
you, you guys said a lot of diverse things, but in, in my experience, there's one thing that really brings some of those diverse items together. What comes to mind? What is the root issue? Missing a ball. <laughs> Missing a ball. Could be. Lack of education. Yeah, it could be. But well, here's, here's my experience. I'll just share with you. And you tell me if you've seen this as well. It was the person who, who said the word rigid. That's the one that, that, for me, starts to get in this direction. Because my experience with leaders who are not effective is that they are usually people for whom everything is all about who? Them. Them, right? Isn't that it? I mean, isn't so much of it really rooted in their own absorption with themselves, right? And it, that manifests itself in many different ways, but very often that's, that's what the center of it is. So the question is, what can we do about that? If that's, if that's the problem that's causing ineffective leaders, how can we avoid that? How can we help those leaders avoid that? Well, I won't ask you to answer that right now, but we will, for the rest of this evening, spend some time talking about exactly that. So let me transition now into, into more details, and I, I want to do that through a, a very simple illustration which is just explaining if, if I was, if any of us were getting ready to go out and build a house, we all know the very first thing we would do, and that is we would build a foundation. And so I want to suggest to you today that there is a foundation of leadership, and that foundation for leadership has nothing to do with what you do as a leader, but everything to do with who you are as a leader. And we put, a, we put a, a label on that. We're going to call that this evening leadership character. And in this first segment, before we take our first break, that's what we'll spend time on. Then we'll come back after that. And, of course, we do want to build out the rest of the house, if you will. So we'll spend some time talking about leadership behaviors, those very important steps that leaders take to be effective. All right? We will actually spend more time talking about the leadership behaviors, but we want to talk, we want to build that foundation first before we go any further. So leadership character was that phrase that I just shared with you. One of those words is character. This is an often misunderstood word. So when I say the word character, what do I mean? What comes to mind? Your personal traits. Okay, personal traits. Say more. Others? character. What do you think? <laughs> it's a bit of a trick question, isn't it? Because it really is, it, it's your personal traits and it, it really is who you are. I'm just, I'm saying that phrase who you are in a, in a slightly different way. It is the core of who you are. It is your identity. And one thing that I want to, I want to point out is that there's a very big difference between your identity, which is who you really are, and this word reputation, which is who people think you are, right? Those can be very different. Now, the longer you know someone, the more likely those are to, are beginning to move together. But I, I want to emphasize that your character really is your identity, and it is rooted in some of your deepest purpose and values. And you, some of you have heard this, I'm sure, but I, I think it's worth repeating. Character is really who you are, when no one else is watching. Your character is not on display when you're up in front of a room talking. Your character is on display. Who you are is really on display when no one else is watching. So I'm going to build a visual that looks like this. All right? So this is where we're going. And I'm going to, I'm going to offer up to you some characteristics that, in aggregate, make for leadership character. The start, so the, the foundation of our foundation, if you will, is this concept of clarity of purpose. And by that, I mean knowing what you believe, knowing what you stand for, knowing, knowing what's important to you. And another way to think about this, remember, this is in many ways a success seminar. Well, having a clear purpose in some ways is having a very good idea, knowing very well what is your 
definition of success. So I want to share with you two quotes. I love these quotes because I think they really illustrate for us what I mean when I say clarity of purpose and what I don't mean. So this is a quote from Rick Warren. He's a, a best-selling American author. He says, without a purpose, life is motion without meaning, activity without direction, and events without reason. Get this last sentence. Without a purpose, life is trivial, petty, and pointless. Anybody want to sign up for that life? <laughs> I don't think so. So this, this helps us understand the importance of having a purpose, but it is still incomplete. So let me, let me make this more, more complete for you. I don't know, maybe you've heard some of you of Oz Guinness. He's a British author, and Oz is quite a, quite a remarkable and entertaining person, and uh, also a social critic. He's got some, some outstanding insights. Listen to what he says. Deep in our hearts, we all want to find and fulfill a purpose bigger than ourselves. And he says, only such a purpose can inspire us to heights we could never reach on our own. So he, he's explaining to us that it's more than just having a purpose because my purpose could be to promote myself. And I think all of us just agreed that's not the leader we want to follow. That's not the leader we want to be. So what Oz Guinness is saying is, yes, we need to have a purpose, but do you want to have a purpose that really inspires you to get up each day? Or at least most days? Um, if you want to have that purpose, that needs to be a purpose that is bigger than yourself. So remember our visual. We start with a clear purpose, and the next thing we have is courage. Acting on your conviction, even when times are tough, regardless of the personal implications. And the sequencing here is very important because courage is acting on your convictions. So what do you need more than anything else to have courage? Convictions, <laughs> right? And that's what we're saying here. We're saying you need to start with convictions. Then you need to have the courage to stand for them. Here's a couple of quotes. Uh, let's move on. A couple of quotes that I, I want to share. One is from Winston Churchill. Churchill said, Courage is the first of human qualities because it is the one that guarantees all others. So let me build on that a little bit. I, I think this is an even more clear way of making a point to you. Claire Luce is one of our first American Congress, <coughs> Congresswomen from the last century. And she had this very insightful statement, courage is the ladder, you know, a ladder, courage is the ladder on which all other virtues mount. So what's the point there? I'll explain it this way. You need to have courage, and if you do not have courage, then some of these other characteristics, humility, integrity, and compassion, they don't stand a chance. You'll never be a person of integrity if you don't have courage to take that stand when the pressure is on. All right? So humility, integrity, and compassion, uh, the way I think about these is, let's start with integrity in the center. I think it's in the center for a reason. It's so central to this whole concept. Integrity is, is really more of an inward focus characteristic. It's, it's, it's knowing the right way to behave and, and acting accordingly. Compassion is more outward, how you relate to others. And humility, in a manner of speaking, is upward. It's, I, I, I know my place in the universe. For somebody, uh, a person of faith, you might say, I, I know my, my place relative to God. All right? And then to cap this all off, we have self-discipline. And in the same way that some of these things don't even get started without courage, oftentimes they're not finished without self-discipline. The ability to, to get that last hundred meters in the race to the finish line. Okay, so I'm going to explain some of these other characteristics a bit more fully. What is humility? It is, one important thing that I want to share here is, 
Oftentimes when I ask groups, what is a characteristic of an effective leader? Almost always somebody says they're confident. And my response to that is, yes, but <laughs> what happens when the leader has too much confidence? Well, that starts to become what? Arrogance. And that leader stops listening, and that leader starts to say, my way or the highway, and you know how that ends. That becomes that ineffective leader. All right. Next is integrity. Integrity, having integrity is practicing deep honesty, uh, exhibiting fairness, justice. It's doing the right thing. In fact, uh, here's a, a good way of thinking about it. Uh, another British author from last century, C.S. Lewis, said integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. So character is who you are when no one's watching, and integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. All right, you know, before I go on, I want to just pause on this, this thought for just a moment, uh, just to provoke your thinking a little bit. It's easy for us, you know, in a room like this, you hear me say, doing the right thing. And you probably all say, yeah, of course. Of course. If I went and asked all of you individually, do you believe in doing the right thing? Of course we all believe in doing the right thing. But... This raises another question, doesn't it? Who decides what the right thing is? <laughs> right? We all say, yeah, 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 we do the right thing. But we all may define it differently, right? So let me ask you this question. Who decides? Who decides what the right thing is? What do you think? I need your help here. Tell me. Well, you have to start from the clarity of purpose first. OK. All right. There onwards, you figure out what the right thing by figuring out uh, is it correct in the terms in relation to others, in, the, in the relation to your goals, and to what you want to achieve. Okay. And so you're using the word "you" a lot of times. So, so basically, what you're saying is it's it's something that, based on your experience and your purpose and other other aspects, you decide what is right and wrong. Uh, well, that's also related to. Uh, Humility. Okay. <laughs> you need to decide what's right and wrong with humility. <laughs> so with others in relation to whom you touch with yeah. certain actions. So okay, that, good. Yeah, it always comes to you as the one. If we're talking about leaders here, so okay. okay. So we're talking about you. Okay, yes. all right. Excellent. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Other opinions? Who decides? Everyone decides for itself. So okay. Okay. And when I'm communicating with you, I have to keep in mind what's good for you. And <laughs> keep in mind I may have a different point of view. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then I have yeah. to respect that and okay. do right by you. And okay. I expect for you to do that right by me. Clear. Other thoughts? Other ideas? Sometimes I hear people say, well, it's the government. Maybe it's our culture, our society decides. Yeah, I hear lots of different answers. But the answer that I hear most is the one that, that you guys have given, which is uh, we decide for ourselves. And we, you know, we try to do it responsibly, but we, we decide for ourselves what is right and wrong. And I, I just want to share with you uh, some perspective regarding that, which is I love that idea. I, I love the idea of deciding for myself what is right and wrong. Because if I do that, then I don't really have accountability to anyone else, and, uh, and so I, I get to kind of make up the rules, in a, in a manner of speaking, that, uh, that are the rules that I, that I desire. So I like the idea, in some ways, of deciding for myself what is right and wrong. Here's the problem I have. I don't like living on a planet where seven billion other people are deciding for themselves what is right and wrong. What do you think of that? How's that going to turn out? Seven billion people deciding for themselves what is right and wrong. What do you think? Not that if you have alignment about clarity of the purpose. Ah, good luck getting that alignment, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let me, let me just finish my thought by uh, just reminding you. You know, I told you 
right at the beginning that I'm a Christian, so it, it would not surprise you uh, if I told you that I define right and wrong based on what it says in the Bible. The Bible has some great moral teaching, among other things, has some great moral teaching on right and wrong that was uh, that is just as relevant today as when it was written more than 3,000 years ago in some cases. But uh, bringing, it, bringing it back now uh, more specifically to leadership, think about this. Uh, by using a reference point, an authority outside of oneself, what you get is something that doesn't change over time. And that's one, one caution that I would give you guys as you think about this area. None of us want to follow a leader who changes depending on which way the wind is blowing, right? And uh, so make sure that you're anchored. Make sure that you're clearly anchored on that, that definition of right and wrong. And you know, maybe, maybe consider some options that go beyond oneself. All right. So compassion. This is respecting differences. Some of the things that you were talking about. Uh, Yelena, is that it? Yeah. yeah. Um, how do you say your name? Yelena? Yelena. Yelena, okay. So it's respecting differences, it's showing care, and being, being a servant leader. Uh, the golden rule, for example. All right, so that's compassion. Self-discipline, this one's pretty straightforward. Doing what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, even when you don't want to do it. All right, so that's leadership character. And uh, I think when you look at this model, and you think about the words that I just shared, think about the words that you're, you're looking at here. Most people say, you know, that sounds, it sounds good, it sounds positive, it sounds aspirational, that's something to strive for, but it leads to another really big question, and I, I want to spend a few minutes this evening on this big question. The question is, can this work here, right? Isn't that going through all of our minds, like, yeah, that sounds really good in a perfect world, Maybe, that, okay, speaker, that may work where you come from, but I'm not sure about whether this can work here. Is anybody having that question in mind? Yeah? All right. I, I mean, most often, that's the response I get. So I want to hit this question head on, and I, the way I want to answer this question, the best way to answer any question that's a really difficult question is to respond with a question, right? <laughs> so here's my question back to you. What if it doesn't work here? What does that look like? And I, I want to make some suggestions to you about what that could look like. Well, instead of having clear purpose that goes beyond self, I have apathy and a focus on self. And instead of having courage, I have cowardice, not taking a stand for anything, but just being flexible to meet my own needs. Instead of integrity, it's dishonesty arrogance instead of humility, disregard for the needs of others. Why? Well, because I'm focused on myself after all, right? And instead of self-discipline at the top, we have anarchy. So if you have this type of an organization, if you have this type of company, if you have this kind of team or this kind of society, what ends up coming of this? What is the end result? Well, here's what I, here's what I would suggest. You get no trust, people don't trust one another at all, and what that eventually leads to is a, is a breakdown in the team or the organization, and it frankly leads to corruption and decay. Anybody want to sign up for that? <laughs> we live in a country like that. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I thought you might be thinking that. Here, to me, and I, I hope you guys agree with me on this, uh, the answer to the question that I've been asked many times, can this work here, is that for the long term, it has to work here because the alternative is so unacceptable. I mean, nobody wants to live this way. And so I, I hope, if nothing else this evening in this area, that you'll just acknowledge, this is not okay, it's not acceptable. And so the answer to the question, can it work here, is it simply must, and we need to find a way to make that happen. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. I, I know I can't just say that and walk away. So in a few minutes, I'll, I'll make a couple of suggestions to you. 
But I, I want to first just flip it back around and just say, you know, if you, if you do have leadership character, nobody, me included, is ever going to do this perfectly. But if you're moving in this direction, what you're going to have is an environment of trust. And this is a great quote. I love this quote. This summarizes my point very simply. Maybe you've heard of Alfred Adler. He was an Austrian psychiatrist from the last century. He said, men of genius are admired. Men of wealth are envied. Men of power are feared. But only men and women is what he meant to say. Of character are trusted. So look at that last phrase. Only men, only people of character are trusted. So if you want to be, well, let me, let me ask you this question, group. How many of you, by show of hands, get your arms loosened up, all right? By show of hands, how many of you would willingly follow, willingly follow, someone that you did not trust? Raise it high. Nobody. Nobody wants to follow that leader. But here's the thing. Sometimes we forget, even though we know that, we forget to turn it around and ask ourselves, why would I, there's 30 some people in this room, why would I expect a single person in this room to follow me if I was not a person who had character and showed himself or herself to be trustworthy? So let me summarize and we'll, we'll wrap up this first segment. Our, this is our stream of logic, all right? So I started by saying to be a leader, you must be followed. If nobody's behind you, you're not leading. Next, I said to be followed, you must be trusted. We, we all just agreed to that. Somewhere along the way, we said that if you want to be trusted, well, Alfred Adler said, if you want to be trusted, you must have character. I think we all understand the truth of that. And remember on that, that visual where the, the bottom floor, that foundation, was clarity of purpose, what we were emphasizing there is that to have character, you must first have a clear purpose, knowing what you're standing for. So I know that's a lot on that slide, but watch what's hap what, what happens when I push this button. <laughs> okay? Let's eliminate all this stuff in the middle. And let's just say the most important point here. To be a leader, it all really starts by having a clear purpose. And one way you might think about that is having a personal mission statement. Do any of you have a personal mission statement? Have you spent time writing out for yourself, here's what I stand for? <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> all right, maybe, maybe some of you have. But uh, I want to suggest to you the power of doing this. And I want to share with you, at this point, an example, which is uh, our friend, Mr. Gandhi. Gandhi said, let the first act of every morning be to make the following resolve for the day. I will not fear anyone on earth. I will fear only God. I will not bear ill towards anyone. I will not submit to injustice to anyone. And look what happens on the next couple of statements here. He begins to draw a line very firmly. And he says, I will conquer untruth by truth. And in resisting untruth, I will put up with whatever I need to put up with. I will put up with all suffering. So he's saying, I am all about seeking, identifying, and defending the truth. So that was, that was Gandhi's personal mission, if you will. So what I'd like to do, um, I want to be efficient about this, um, but I, I think we have the time. So let me ask you to do this. Take out your, your paper that you have there. Can I borrow yours for a moment? All right, so on this page, you see at the top, it says leadership, character, personal, mission, Statement. All right. Excuse me. Anybody needs a pen? Okay. Sorry. And you see there, there are two sections. 
two sections. One section at the top says my priorities, I think. My priorities? Yeah. Right, my, my priorities at the bottom and then my purpose at the top. All right? So what I'd like you to do, we're going we're gonna to do this inverted. Okay, we're going to do this uh, starting with what's most important, my priorities. So what I'd like you to do is to write down uh, as many as eight items that are the most important things to you. Not for today, you know, that may be most important things, I need to go to the grocery store so I have food when I get home. But think over the long, you know, the medium to long term, what are the most important things for me? I think I've listed some ideas on there, you know, maybe, maybe family, and maybe your role as a husband or wife or a parent, it may be your, something related to your career. If you're a person of faith, it may relate to God. Whatever it is, it may be some of those things, it may be none of those things. Whatever it is for you, I want you to take, let's do this very quickly, take about two or three minutes to write down hopefully up to eight things that are most important priorities for you. Okay, now look here if you would. By the way, <laughs> I should have mentioned this before. Uh, this is a personal mission statement, and so this is not a share it with your neighbor kind of exercise, okay? I'm not going to ask you to share it with anybody. This is really for your eyes only. And the other thing that I want to acknowledge is that working on your personal mission statement, one of the most important things you can do in life, is not best done in a group of 30 people <laughs> in five minutes. It's best done with a lot of thought and, uh, you know, maybe some discussion with a mentor or something like that. So, more than anything, I'm not, I'm not asking you to have a finished product when you leave here today. I'm hoping you have something that helps you understand how you might approach putting a personal mission statement together, okay? So, sometimes we say, yeah, I could do a personal mission statement. Where do I start? You know, what do I include? So I'm hoping this process will give you something to think about and in uh, a process to use to complete this task later. All right, so here's what I want you to do. Take your pens, and uh, I know some of you don't have eight uh, items, but what I'd like you to do is for three, well, I'll say it this way, for all except the most, the five most important things. I want you to take your list down to five things that are most important. And take, take your pen and just draw a thin line through everything except the top five. Is that clear? I don't, I don't think a, a native English speaker could have understood what I just said. <laughs> I confused myself when I said that. But when you're done, I want, you to, I want you to have a list of five most important things and just draw a thin line through the other items, okay? Got that done? Okay. All right, now look up here. I'll tell you what to do next, and I'll try to do it more simply. I'll try to learn from my mistakes. <laughs> now what I want you to do is take out your pen and draw a thin line through everything except the top three. So we're converging. Now I want the, the three most important things there, okay? Okay, I also like to make sure that it's clear that if you have some names on here and you cross them out, you do not need to tell them, okay? <laughs> and it's for you to know only. Okay, you have your list of three? All right, now guess what I want you to do? No, you don't need to pick one. That would be too predictable. <laughs> here's, here's the thought. Uh, by the time people get down to three items on their list, usually somewhere in those three items lies some insight about what their purpose is. So now what I want you to do is look at those three items, and with those items in mind, go to the top line where it says my purpose, and write down, I suggest, one or two, maybe three sentences, okay? One is fine. 
you know, strive for one or two, and write down, based on what is most important to me, what do I see as my purpose, my mission, my definition of success? Okay? So take a moment to write down one or two sentences. Okay. I know some of you are still writing, but I, I really encourage you to, what is today? Thursday. I'm losing track of my days. Um, I encourage you, set aside some time this weekend and pull this back out again. And in the quiet of your home, really think deeply about, about what you're going to include here. And here's one more tip, okay? From my experience and seeing many documents like this, very often, people focus their purpose more on what they want to do with their lives than why they want to do it. And if you think about the word purpose, purpose is a, is a why topic, right? So as you refine this and as you spend time thinking through it, look at that statement that you wrote down and ask yourself, why? Why do I want to do that? And maybe write that down. And then ask yourself again, why? <laughs> and keep, keep asking yourself why until you really understand deep down inside, what, what are you striving for? And it'll help you understand, is this a purpose that goes beyond myself? Right? We said that's really an important part of this, is the purpose that goes beyond self. All right. So I want to finish now with uh, just the last couple of thoughts. Uh, remember a moment ago I, I encouraged you that, uh, you know, that none of us want to live in a place where we can't succeed with leadership character. Well, I know that could sound good but be pretty difficult to do. So here's a couple of thoughts for you. One is I would, I would never ask you just to go off and change your behaviors. Don't run off and just try even harder to do some of the things that we've listed up here. But really focus on who you are. And I, I've shared with you before, for me, that, that becomes a pretty spiritual issue, you know, if I want to change deep down inside. So I, I just encourage you to think very deeply about your purpose and also about changing who you are um, as, as appropriate. Uh, next... <laughs> I want to pause on this one for a second. When you think about leadership character and where you are on the journey of having leadership character, don't trust your own assessment of yourself necessarily, but find a person who can give you some feedback. It really helps to understand where we are in that journey by getting some input from others. I want to share with you a kind of an amusing illustration or example here. And it relates to a, a piece of research. Uh, by the way, we have about two or three minutes left before you get out of your seat. So stick with me for two or three minutes and then you get a chance to, to refresh a little bit. So a piece of research and it consists of a survey with one question. Okay, one question. And that question was for men. So men, I'm going to ask you that question this evening. Ladies, you can listen in. But the question is for you, men, and I do not want you to answer this question out loud, okay? Just think about the question, and then I'm going to tell you where to go from there. So here's the question, men, because this, this was a piece of research that was done. The question is, are you above average athletically compared to other people in your peer group? Okay? Got it? You understand? All right, so don't answer, but you understand the question. Are you above average athletically, so as, a, as an athlete, a sportist, uh, compared to other people in your peer group? So now, man, I want you to, ladies, let me keep the discussion with the men for just a moment. Man, I want to hear from you. Not your answer, but what percentage of men do you think, in this research, what percentage of men see themselves as above average? <laughs> ladies, ladies, don't destroy the mood here, okay? 
what percentage of men see themselves as above average athletically? Men, what do you think? Over 90%. Over 90%, yeah. Men, other, other men? Come on, stand up for mankind here. What do you think? Around 80. 80, we got 80 to, 80 to 90. All right, ladies, I know you're, you're ready to overflow. What percentage do you think? A uh, hundred. <laughs> the ladies, oh, the, the ladies know the man better than the men know the man. That's, that's my conclusion. Well, here's the answer. This is pretty amazing. Ninety-four percent of men see themselves as above average athletically. So think. <laughs> think about this for a minute, okay? There may be. Let's say there were 20 men in this room, 20, okay? That would mean, if you, if you do the mathematics, that would mean that 19 of those 20 men see themselves as being above average in probably everything, but, <laughs> but certainly in athletics. And that would mean nine of them are flat wrong, right? If you, if you look at the mathematics. 19 think they're above average, 9 are wrong, 10 of us are right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> all right, so what is my point with all that? The point is, think about athletics. Athletics is something you can measure. You can see it, you can measure it, you can time it, you can weigh it, you know, you can do all these things. Character? Wow. That's really hard. It's hard, and hard for all of us to really know where are we really in our journey of having this type of character that we talked about. So again, I just I encourage you to invite, invite some of your closest friends or family members to, to give you some feedback in some of these areas. Last thing I want to say before the break is uh, in this area of leadership character and this area of making a difference in your, in your community, in your society, in your company, and, and really, you know, beginning to create uh, an environment of trust like we talked about. I know all of you said, you know, many of you said, wow, I, I'm just not sure how to do that here. We, we kind of are where we are here. And I'll tell you, one person individually doesn't stand a chance, but find a community, you know, find some mentors. Be a mentor. A number of you already have a lot of experience, and you could mentor other like-minded people. But whether you mentor or not, find a community, and I, I want to do a quick commercial for, uh, for Nolan and his focus organization here. That is a group of people who believe this stuff, and believe this stuff can make a big difference in individual lives, which can be transformed, and in societies as well. I'm going to finish with this quote. Uh, Margaret Mead, uh, uh, an author uh, from years ago, said, Never doubt that a small group of committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. That is where it starts, is with a small community of committed citizens.